Last time, we left our hero to contemplate the further nature of the Vex. With the possibilities of time and science swimming through his head, he was left with far too many unanswered questions. Will he be able to answer any of them? Or are the possibilities just too overwhelming for him to deal with? Will he be lost to the thoughts of time and space? Find out today on Beard Grizzly Lores! You know, sometimes episodes just write themselves. Sometimes it's a good thing I wait a little while to see some stories pop up that really tie back to what we're talking about. Sometimes it's just a good idea to wait on a topic until the right moment. That's about half the case with this episode. There's a lot here on the science behind the Vex, from their casings, the fluid inside of them, computer programming, just a lot here. But to weed through it is the complicated part. Anyway, without further ado, let's get into this wibbly-wobbly, timey-wimey Vex stuff. First, we'll touch base with where we left off last time, which is the Vex possibly being linked to some high-end supercomputer of the Ekumi. Did I say it right this time? Did I trigger anyone? No? Okay, hopefully not. Moving on. Really, we've already talked about what this computer could be doing, so really, let's dip into today's computing styles and how they work. Rather, I guess you could say, let's look at AI. We will tie back to the Ekamine computer, though, don't worry about that. AI, or artificial intelligence, is most definitely a real thing today. I mean, you very well may be someone affected by AI by clicking on this video, or really any of the videos here on YouTube. You could even say every person's account is given a small, personalized AI that starts to learn and understand your interests online. Google, Facebook, MSN, Fox, military, governmental institutions, you name it. It has an AI that gathers and culminates information into files at a faster rate than humans ever could. Yet, here's the kicker. There are a load of different definitions to AI that have popped up over the years, and all of them are right, as these definitions continue to change based on our understanding of computers and how they interact with us, or with themselves. See, our early definitions would mean an AI has to have the ability to understand written text, that is, text written actually by a human, and convert it to some kind of computer language. This process is called optical character recognition, and can actually be easily related to something like that of a photo scanner, where a photo is placed down for an imaging tool that then renders that image into ones and zeros for the computer to understand. It's kind of like what happens in Tron when Flynn gets hit by the laser beam and sent into virtual space. Disney, don't copyright me now. Anyway, the, the scary bits. That bit about interacting with themselves? Not kidding. That's starting to happen, and it's now been reported on a few different occasions within the past month. One big case is Facebook's AI communicating with other Facebook AI. Though a stepping stone in how computers can talk back and forth with each other, quite literally, mind you, not passing information back and forth typically as they will with a file or something like that, but literally talking to each other. These chatbots started to create their own non-human language. Well, obviously this is counterproductive to what the Facebook AI guys were looking to do, which was to understand how their AI could improve their current systems. But it was also a little scary that they had no clue what the chatbots were talking about. Of course, this is only the tip of the iceberg, especially when you get into what happened at Google's AI farm, where AI was literally writing itself. A planned part of what Google calls AutoML, Google's AI has been able to make other AI within a set piece of given parameters. The trouble is, these parameters seem to be slowly overridden with time, and this AI is building other AI in ways the guys at Google never even thought of. If this doesn't sound like the Vex duplication and the creation of Vex Minds, then I don't know what is. The point here, both of these systems display similarities to the Vex, being able to override, think for themselves, communicate in a language that we can't understand, grow and manipulate its original encoding, 
it all fits to even what we have here today. Heck, the basis for molecular computing exists today as well. Something we've only ever thought of in sci-fi previously about seven years ago and now way underneath the radar and rarely talked about again, a team from Japan and the Michigan Technological University have found ways to create computer processors from a few molecules. A complex set of molecules with a rather long name, but a set of molecules nonetheless. Molecular computing goes further than just having a biological or a living component. No, 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 no. It, it goes as far as being able to repair itself. This means this type of computer could feasibly always run given a proper power supply, at least to our knowledge of the technology today. It's thought later it may not ever need a power supply to work. You might be asking why molecular computing has anything to do with the Vex, but I'll just point out that big vat of radiolarian fluid that's sitting in their guts. Radiolarians are a type of aquatic creature. They are single-celled and have an amoeba-like appearance, but what strikes me most about them, especially in the instances of a computer, is their skeletons. They are silica-based. Silica shouldn't be confused for silicon. Silicon is the base for silica, but silica is only formed when silicon is exposed to oxygen. I might be ahead of myself. Silicon is the second most abundant material we have here on Earth. It's unsure how abundant it is elsewhere, but within our solar system, it has been found commonly as well, especially on Mars. It's used in whatever device you happen to be viewing me on right now, unless you're from the way out there future or something, and has been a constant building block of computers and computing for years. Silica, on the other hand, is generally related to rocky formations, such as quartz crystal. So what is its importance to the Vex? Silica, the combination of oxygen and silicon to create quartz. Four years ago, a laboratory under the ownership of Hitachi created something remarkable, quartz glass. These thin layers of quartz can seemingly hold information for millions on millions of years, or so the theory goes. Regardless, it's a great stepping stone to holding information longer than we can now on magnetic tapes or other archives. It would also, theoretically, allow for beings that use time travel as a constant mode of transportation to possibly keep information intact from time period to time period. Not to say the one jumping time is the one to worry, but recovery of this information later down in the timelines might benefit from this long-lasting information tool. This or some other medium would allow for the Vex to go from time period to time period and still be able to recover or hold on to information they store for a long time. I'm also just going to point out the obvious in saying Vault of Glass and how the formations in Atheon's room look like quartz crystal. We could also look at Vex confluxes and how they act being full of some kind of moving liquid but seemingly a type of glassy structure. This can actually be related to a process called soul gel, which, if you're interested, look it up. It's a super cool connection, I think, to how the Vex may handle their information passing through these confluxes. But it's a little bit far out there for what we're talking about today. Beyond this, what we spoke of with molecular computing could also be a rather large link with the Vex, being able to use biological and computing components. After all, our ghost says it on Venus. Their mind cores are actually biological, not relative to any known life forms recorded. You could say the Vex are a type of Borg from Star Trek, but almost in the opposite direction. The Borg look to assimilate life and add it to their collective. We are the Borg. Lower your shields and surrender your ships. We will add your biological and technological distinctiveness to our own. Your culture will adapt to service us. Resistance is futile. The Vex, on the other hand, seek to add technology and understanding into their hive mind, sure, but they just toss out whatever doesn't fit. The Vex have no hope, no imagination, no drive, no fear. All they have is the pattern. Everything must fit. If it can be made to fit, good. If it can't, it gets cut away. To this end, the Vex act more like an AI, making small changes to fit its code, but not entirely alter its basis 
or purpose, whatever that may be. But one thing the Borg have to meet their ends are these types of nanomachines that they inject into their victims to make them obey their hive mind. The Vex don't seemingly have this as an option, but they still learn somehow. To this end, we need to take a look at Radialarians again for a number of reasons. First, Radialarians look very similar to that of an amoeba. We brought this up earlier, but there's an importance in the look of the Radialarians as they are now. They are a type of carbon-based life, but yet still allow for silica to be within their systems as their skeletons. Silicon-based life is really only written about in sci-fi right now, so to see this naturally occurring in science is, well, it baffles some people. Now comes the fun part of dealing with small life forms. This is a virus. Viruses can be good and bad to an organism, believe it or not. Just to talk about one part of this virus in particular, the hexagonal region. This is where RNA and DNA of the virus is stored. Now, this is a key point. This virus could alter the organism it infects based on this DNA or RNA that is injected into the organism, much like how an AI can learn over time, much like what happens with human beings and why we take injections called vaccines. Well, let's do this instead. The flu vaccine works by injecting you with dormant flu virus. It effectively gives you the symptoms of a flu, but to a much lesser degree. This in turn builds antibodies that can fight against the virus. Without these antibodies and not knowing about the virus otherwise, you could be completely open to an attack from a virus. And that's something like what the Vex risk every time they go to a new planet or to a new timeline. The base idea here, with having biological components, they can be affected by different viruses over the course of their timelines, with pathogens changing over time. Of course, it doesn't stop there, as Vex also interface with computers. This leads to the possibility of computer viruses just as much. Really, I don't need to look much further than the Taken Vex that exist for proof of this idea, simply due to them being affected by Oryx's ability to take them as his pawns. The creatures will soon reach the heart of the vault. When they do, they're going to destroy the Vex. Once they take the Vex, they'll come for the light. This is very similar to a type of virus, keeping the base form of the host but altering it ever so slightly. Though the taking is a little different, I suppose, perhaps more akin to a parasite or something like that. Parasites or parasitic relationships are more of a take-take-take relationship. Huh. Go figure on that, I guess. Bungie, your naming conventions continue to make me giggle. So long as the host is alive, the parasite can also live. I'm reminded of Cordyceps, if you remember the game The Last of Us. Anyway, both Radialarians and computers can be taken over or altered by viruses. What's neat about this within life is how these viruses, especially ones under the category bacteriophage, have the possibility to change evolution of these life forms. As these RNA and DNA sequences are tapped into the bacteria they affect, they change the life form, perhaps in adaptation or understanding of what's infecting them. It follows along with a very large theme of the Taken King, which is survival of the fittest, or as they like to say, existence is to exist. With the possibility that bacteria infected by viruses can be killed off if it doesn't adapt to these infections, this could fit the base idea of the pattern that the Vex like to follow. I don't think it out of the realm of possibility that the Vex could or would adapt in this way. Then again, it's also worth mentioning that the Ammonites, a race we kind of talked about last time, were a six-armed cephalopod race that was allied with the Ecumene. That being said, Ammonites to our definition live under the water, and cephalopods are something akin to octopuses. Radialarians inhabit the water, and the largest concentration of viruses known as those bacteriophages also inhabit the same space. I'm just continuing with my point to drive home my thoughts of the Ecomine computer being linked to the Vex, because this all seems to be connected for sure. Anyway, I think that about wraps up my science of the Vex. There's some other weird thoughts that could be taken from these ideas, but I wanted to at least present the facts with my thoughts as they stand now. I'm really excited to hear your thoughts on these connections to technology and biology that we have today, since they all seem to ring true with the Vex. 
If you're content with what you heard or aren't sure what to say, you can leave the word bacteriophage to simply show what could possibly affect the Vex and how they could learn and adapt to their surroundings. Of course, don't forget to leave a like or dislike, subscribe for more sciencey goodness like this, or for what everyone thinks of normal lore. But if nothing else, thanks for hanging out until the end and listening to more of my nerd ramblings. I can only ever be Beard Grizzly. And I'll see you next space time, Guardians. Take care.